the uh, phone calls and inquiries that I get pretty much with the interest in the survey of aircraft lies, but the horsepower, I'm surprised. I get a lot more calls, it seems, for, for a little bit less horsepower, but at the air shows that I've been to, there's a lot of interest in the 130 horsepower. So thank you for, for doing thank you for doing the surveys. At the, <clears throat> the bottom right hand side of the screen, each slide I'll have the website and at any point you can go there as my contact information. Also on the last slide I will give my contact information. Here's a picture of the engine. Basically We've got four different model engines today. It's modern technology, it's direct drive, it's air-cooled, it's multi-point electronic ignition with VADAC. It's got a good power to weight ratio and good fuel efficiency. I want to start out though by talking about you know, what is UL power? And I want everybody to think about you know, other, other airplane company engines, uh, like Lycoming. I think to myself, when I hear Lycoming, somebody on their show or somebody talking to me on the phone says Lycoming, and I think of I have a lot of childhood memories. We grew up. I grew up with a Piper Cherokee, and it had the light coming in it. Um, Vans is very popular. They appreciate the light coming. So I think about the Vans aircraft. Um, I think about the new light coming engine. But I think about the people too, and I think about the service centers, and I think about the, you know what it stands for. Continental the same way. I think of Continental. I think of Cessna. I think of the new O200, the lightweight one. I had a. a Cessna 140. Guys can, guys, can I interrupt here just for a second? We're getting a little bit of a uh, mic echo. Um, I wonder if we could adjust your mics just a little bit. How's that now? Let's uh, let's go ahead and give that a try. I'm getting a lot of comments about uh, of some mic echo. So let's let's try whatever you tried, and we'll go from there. Okay, I adjusted my microphone, so hopefully that's a little bit better. Okay, that sounds better to me. Let's go for it. Okay. So when I think Continental, I think about Cessna, and and I had a, a Cessna 140 years ago, and I think of the O200, and I think of the, the new O200 that Continental has developed. So it's more than just an engine; it's it's the whole thing. So in that context, what is UL Power? UL Power. There's a company called UL Power Aero Engines, and that's part of the whole equation. And there's UL Power North America, which is the distributor for United States and Canada. And then we've got the engines. We have our current engines, the four engines that, that I'll talk about. And then we've got the OEM agreements. We've got uh, Zenith Aircraft has wholeheartedly adopted the engine and has developed a firewall forward kit. And so I think of Zenith when I think about UL Power. And then the customers. You know, the customers are awesome. I learn more information about the engines from my customers than I do on my own. And the customers help each other, so it's really, it's it's kind of like Chad was saying that he used the word community. There's a community in the aviation industry, and you go to Oshkosh, you go to Sun and Fun, and you feel the community. And so there's developing a little UL Power community, and it's all of these things combined. So the, the engines are made in Belgium, and they're made basically by it's a consortium of two companies. UL Power Aero Engines was founded about eight years ago, and its two companies came together. There's an engine company, and this engine company, for a long, long time, has been designing and building uh, race engines, primarily for, for road rally races in, in Europe. And they got together with a metal company, and the metal company produces a lot of the components, nearly all of the components that are used in the UL power engines. And so it's a nice combination. They put together the design, and then they, they make a lot of the components themselves, and they build the engines. And what's nice about that is they're able to, to make design changes quickly, they can do whatever they want, they can experiment, and uh, they control a lot of their own components. There's a lot of vertical integration, so that's really nice. All right, guys, I'm going to interrupt one more time. If one of, if, if uh, maybe, Sebastian, if you could turn your mic off while Robert's talking, um, that might be part of the problem. We're, we're still getting some mic echo uh, and some breakup. It might be the internet connection, but um, go ahead and see if you can shut one of the mics off. Or just unplug it completely until uh, until Sebastian needs to talk. Okay, I will uh, try to do that. I adjusted my mic again as well. Okay, its comments are coming back and forth. Some are fine. Some are um, some are getting no echo. So uh, let's just roll with it. Okay, so we started we started UL Power North America. 
about March of last year. And the intention with UL Power North America is, is to, uh, to promote sales in the United States and Canada and to support the engines you know, during the sales process and the installation process and then also service the engines you know, during the installation and, and long after the installation. We have a service center uh, agreement with a, a very good service center in southern Missouri. It's uh, vertical performance. And the owner of Vertical Performance has been building engines his entire life. You know, starting in high school, he built race engines for motorcycles. And um, most recently, he's done a lot of work on the uh, Rotorway Exec helicopter engine. And so he has a lot of experience with fuel injection, electronic ignition, and VADEC. And he's made a lot of modifications of his own to the Rotorway helicopters. So he's got a lot of knowledge and skills and abilities. And so with respect to the service, uh, we've got him in place, and then we're, we're talking with uh, some other service centers around the United States, you know, the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest, and then on the East Coast, we hope to have two service centers as well. So we'll, we'll have good uh, service distribution. And then the OEM agreement uh, is important to us. Um, the, the kit builder really has changed. The profile of the typical kit builder really has changed. We've gone away more from experimenting, and um, there's a lot more. The kits have developed. They've progressed quite a bit. They've evolved. And so we want the kit manufacturers to adopt our engine and promote our engine and do a firewall forward kit. And so I view all of these things as part of UL Power North America because really we need it all to, to make it work. Okay, the engines specifically, the way the company started, the, the race company that I mentioned, race engine company that I mentioned in Belgium, about eight years ago, an uh, ultralight helicopter manufacturer in Europe went to them, and they had an engine in their helicopter um, that was just too heavy or not producing enough horsepower. And so they asked them if they could modify that engine or lighten that engine so they could get the takeoff performance they need and the flight performance that they wanted. But they weren't able to do it. And so what they told the company was, this helicopter company, um, we can design an engine for you from scratch that will meet the specification that you need. And so they went ahead and did that. They developed the first engine, which was the 260i, the 97 horsepower engine. And so from, from there, they developed the 260is, which is the 107 horsepower, the 350i, which is the 118 horsepower, and the 350is, which is the 130 horsepower. And the company, the designers, the developers, the producers of the engine, um, they are taking this uh, business very, very seriously, and they're developing a new six-owner engine, and they've done some dyno tests on the first model. The engine weighs about 220 pounds, and it produced about 220 horsepower on the dyno. So they've got some really nice um, designs, and they're, they're really um, serious about the business, and they're, they're in the business for the long term. OK, the, 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 the design itself, in working with this helicopter company from scratch, they wanted an aircraft engine. So they started out on purpose to build an aircraft engine. And if you look at Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia has kind of replaced Webster's in terms of definitions. Wikipedia says by far the most common aircraft engine under 400 horsepower is a four or six cylinder, horizontally posed, direct drive, air-cooled, wet sump engine. Now I'm gonna switch here just for a second to Wikipedia because this is fascinating to me. Presuming I can switch. Here we go. Okay, here, uh, hopefully everybody can see it. This is the Wikipedia page for aircraft engine, and it's talking 
about the different designs of aircraft engines. And I'm just going to scroll down. It talks about the different designs, and then it shows some of the engines. Like it's got the right vertical uh, force over here, and it talks about the history of the aircraft engines. And then it more different types here. And the left hand corner here, you'll see it describes the horizontally opposed engine. And this is the section where it talks about the horizontal six cylinder okay. horizontally opposed being the top Hey, Robert. I was really excited because Robert. all these you know world famous engines. Robert, let me interrupt here. Uh, I, I think yeah. this, I think we've got a bandwidth issue with with what you're running on your computer. Um, any any time you switch to uh, when you switch between your PowerPoint and over to the uh, to the internet, your audio went real, real bad. So I'm not I'm not sure that's that's going to work to keep the internet open like that. I can close that. Like lose, I won't lose the Citrus connection. Yeah, close close everything that you can, and and. Uh, We'll try it. It's it's it sounds like it's definitely a bandwidth issue now because as soon as you switched over to the internet, uh, we had we had sound issues. Sorry about that, everybody. We'll get, we'll work through it. Okay, how's that? Okay, you're back on the PowerPoint now. It's, it should be fine as long as there's not a whole lot of stuff running in the background. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, I'll just stay on this screen. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, what I want to point out on Wikipedia when you get to the to the uh, four-cylinder horizontally opposed engine. It has a picture of the UL Power engine, and so that was just exciting for me because we're we're listed there in Wikipedia with all of the the historical world famous engines. So that was exciting. So the designers, in working with this helicopter company, set out to build an on-purpose aircraft engine, and that's exactly what they did. Plus, they added they added new technology. One of the uh, the writers for one of the aviation magazines told me, he said, if the designer of the O200 was alive today, this is the engine that he would build. Because it's basically, you know, the four-cylinder, horizontally opposed, air-cooled engine with the direct drive. And it's got new materials. It's got some really nice aluminum. It's got some really nice steel. The steel components have real high levels of manganese. So they're very strong. They're very resistant to corrosion. The engine was designed on a computer, and the engine is that a lot of components are machined using the computer. And so we're able to have a lot on the cooling fins, for instance, on the cylinder heads. There's just a lot of surface area, and so the cylinder head temperatures run very cool. In addition to this, with those two things, the new material and the computer-aided manufacturing, the engine is a lot lighter, and the engine is a lot stronger. On top of this, we have multi-point fuel injection, we have electronic ignition, and we have FADEC. Why fuel injection? What's nice about fuel injection is it matches the fuel with the engine needs based upon the following items. If you compare, you think back to, to carburetors, and especially with cars, you know, current cars, new technology or current technology cars, really for quite a while, are using fuel injection and they start so much easier. Think back to when you had a carbureted car and on a cold day how difficult it was to start it. And with a cold engine how difficult it was to start it. And, and depending upon the, the elevation where you're located, you know, could make a huge difference on starting it. And then not just the startup, but the, the whole operation, depending upon, you know, rapid acceleration or deceleration or the throttle position, uh, the carburetor, you know, could have issues. And then what's nice about fuel injection is it's taking all these things into consideration and it's matching the fuel air ratio uh, with the ignition and the, the fuel needs of the engine and these other items. We have multi-point injection. 
Multi-point injection basically means there's four fuel injectors. There's one located at the, the inlet basically to each, right at the, where the, the intake manifold meets the cylinder head. And what's nice about multi-point injection is there's an equal mass of fuel to each cylinder. And so uh, the engine runs smoother, uh, it's more efficient, it's getting the proper amount of fuel in each cylinder versus just having one injector at the throttle body. Another thing that's nice about multi-point injection is because the uh, injectors are right at the cylinder head, there's no need for a primer and there's no vapor lock. A lot of fuel injection engines have the uh, injector at the throttle body and so the, the whole length of the intake manifold, there's a chance you can build up vapor there and so it makes it a little bit harder to start on occasion. Benefits of fuel injection, the engine is more efficient, the injectors atomize the fuel compared to a carburetor, the engines run much smoother because there's equal amount of fuel, consistent amount of fuel going to the combustion chamber. They're more dependable, there's less engine wear because there's a better, better combustion, uh, there's much less chance of detonation and so uh, the engine lasts longer. There's less oil contamination because there's less chance of fuel getting into the oil. There's theoretically more power because it's always got the proper fuel air ratio. And on top of all that, there's no carburetor ice, and so there's no need for carburetor heat. Okay, we also have FADEC. FADEC stands for Full Authority Digital Engine Control. The data that goes to the FADEC, FADEC is basically a computer, it's a black box. They're very common in automotive applications. The FADEC unit is installed into the firewall inside the cockpit. So data that goes to the FADEC, picture the FADEC having a uh, program in it, and it's the program needed to determine how much is the proper fuel air ratio and what is the appropriate time to ignite the spark on the spark plug. So from the engine, the following data is sent to the computer. The air pressure, the manifold air temperature, the manifold air pressure, oil temperature, crankshaft position, and the throttle position. All of that data then is put into the formula and then the FADEC output calculates when to open the fuel injector, how long to keep the injector open, and the ignition timing. In addition to that, one thing that's nice is that the fuel pump can be wired through the FADEC. So when you first power up the FADEC, it pressurizes the fuel system, it immediately shuts off the fuel pump until the engine starts. As soon as the engine starts, it turns the fuel pump back on. As soon as the engine stops, like a prop strike, or when you shut down the engine, it turns off the fuel pump, so there's less chance of a fire. So the data out of the FADEC is controlling the operation of the engine basically, so it's always running at its optimum performance. Two more items that come out of the, the FADEC are data to the instruments, and then also the uh, there's an RS-232 port. You can connect your laptop and do diagnostics and, and check on those. So FADEC, what does it really mean? It means in the cockpit there's no choke, there's no primer, there's no carburetor heat, and there's no mixture. What's nice about that is there's a lot fewer parts to install, there's a lot fewer parts that can break, and it makes for much easier operation. There's a, a lot less workload in the cockpit, you can focus on flying the airplane. Can we have four, currently have four models, the UL260i, 260IS, 350I, the 350IS. The, the I, is a 8.16 compression ratio and it can use 91 octane fuel or 100 low lead and it can use up to 15 percent ethanol whereas the 260 IS and the 350 IS are a higher compression ratio they require 93 octane or they can likewise use 100 low lead and up to 15 percent ethanol. The engine prices at 97 horsepower for about $17,000 on up to 130 horsepower about $23,000. Right in the middle of the screen is the 260 ISA. That is a fully aerobatic engine and it's about 21,000, 22,000. This is a budget comparison. <clears throat> uh, Vans offers a power plant kit for the RV12 uh, the kit costs $27,785, and that's without the cowl. The cowl is provided in a different kit, so it's not actually included in that $27,000. Uh, 
the UL260IS, which is the 107 horsepower engine, is $18,600. And if you estimate about $4,500 for the firewall forward, including the mount, the cowl, the propeller, the spinner, all the miscellaneous you know, connect items to connect the engine uh, to the airframe, the total is about $23,100. Uh, keep in mind we have the 260i, which would be a little bit less than this, and then we have the 350i and the 350is. But still, it's it's quite a cost savings compared to the uh, the kit available from Vans. I mentioned at the beginning uh, that I really appreciate the OEMs that are adopting the engine, and my my preference to work with OEMs. Uh, Sebastian is with us tonight, and he will speak for Zenith Aircraft. Uh, Zenith has been uh, great to work with, and they've got firewall forward kits for their aircraft, and uh, they've started taking orders, and it's just working great. I really appreciate working with them. Kit Fox has a customer that's bought an airplane, has bought an engine, and Kit Fox is going to put the two together. They're going to test the performance, and if they're satisfied with their performance, their plan is to offer a firewall forward kit for the UL power. Just aircraft, uh, there are quite a few uh, just Highlanders flying with UL power. The individual owners purchased the engines and uh, with the help of some others, they got mounts and cowls. So there are some just Highlander flying and just aircraft company is interested in receiving an engine and installing an aircraft and doing some testing themselves. RANS is in about the same situation as just aircraft. If they have a customer that is interested in putting you all power on it, they would be happy to work with that customer and do some flight testing. So if any of you have any of those aircraft or, or other aircraft and you would like you all power and the manufacturer does not yet have a program, you know, uh, feel free to contact them and encourage them to work with us to do a firewall forward kit. On the RV-12, in speaking with BAMS, uh, they did not want to do a firewall forward kit, and so we are working with our first RV-12 customer, and they've put the mount on the plane, put the engine on the mount, and they're uh, making some changes to the mount and developing a cowl, and we will work closely with them and see how that project goes, and perhaps we'll offer a firewall forward kit ourselves for the RV-12. Here are some customer comments that I've received over the last couple of months from customers I thought I would share with you guys. One guy says he loves UL Power, he wants to be featured in an ad. There's another guy, he's 9,000 feet into the altitude airport with no problems. And he's got a Xena 650 with a UL 260i. And he said startup is no problem, takeoff performance is, is no problem. He's very happy with the engine. Another guy uh, installed an engine on his first startup. He said, you know, turn the key and it goes hum. And then he said the problem he had was he turned the key off and it kept going hum because he didn't have the, uh, the wiring set up properly. So when he turned off the key, the engine continued to run. But he's got that fixed and he's very happy. Another comment, cruising at 2200 RPM during 100 miles per hour, burning four gallons per hour. I think that's awesome performance. Another guy was with him when he opened up his crate when he received his engine and he couldn't believe uh, how few components there are. His comment was, where's the rest of the engine? It's a very simple engine and so he was real happy with it. And then a comment I really received recently at the uh, Zenith 701 customer. He's got a 260i and he was, he was just so amazed with the performance of the engine. He says, it climbs like I'm being chased by something ugly. Resources and information, I will be at Sun and Fun, I will be at Oshkosh, if any of you are there, I'd love to meet you. I have a Facebook page, you can go into Facebook and search for UL Power. I try to uh, put a lot of the project information on there and some pictures and things. The website is ulpower.net, you can go on there and get my contact information. Also on the website we have the installation manuals, the operating manuals, the illustrated parts catalog, maintenance manuals, and a lot of the brochures and other information. Here's my contact information. It's got my phone number and my email address. If there's any questions that we don't get to tonight that anybody would like to email to me, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer you individually. And that's it. Thank you very much.
Chad, are you out there? I am here. All right. Well, I, I take it that's a cue for me to, uh, to uh, chime in here. And uh, uh, first of all, is, is my audio all right here? Yours actually sounds uh, just fine, Sebastian. All right. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, <laughs> Not sure what was up with the other mic, but that's all right. Yeah. Well, I, it was, I, I was able to understand it. It was actually quite interesting. Even for me, I've heard uh, most of this information before, but it, uh, I think Robert did a good job of uh, explaining the background of UL Power and, and the different uh, uh, models uh, that are available for, for the different uh, applications. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself, I guess uh, I need to uh, get the screen over to me. Is there something I need to do for that, Chad? Um, give it to you here in just a second. Okay, and then I will get started. Uh, okay. okay, you are the presenter. Very nice. Now, is that coming up on the screen now? Is my uh, is yep looks all great. All right. All right. Well, good evening, folks, uh, and uh, and thanks for having me on. Uh, as a guest uh, presenter tonight, I know this was a, uh, a UL Power presentation, and uh, and uh, Robert Helms uh, asked me to uh, to speak a little bit more about uh, our involvement with UL Power as uh, as uh, as an OEM customer and as uh, as a user of those engines, and uh, to give a little bit of background about uh, about Zenith Aircraft Company, uh, we're we're a kit aircraft manufacturer, and we've been manufacturing airplane kits. In, in the United States at, at our factory in Missouri since 1992 and prior to that my father uh, started uh, Zen Air up in Canada in the in the early 70s so we've been around many many years in the kit aircraft industry uh, we've also been involved in manufacturing SLSA aircraft even a type certified uh, primary category aircraft uh, in the uh, mid 90s but our, our real love in, is in uh, is in uh, sport aviation and, and manufacturing aircraft kits for sport pilots and uh, so so for us uh, you know have finding good engines is, is definitely a big part of, of our business you know we're we're designers and manufacturers of aircraft but uh, and, and and not engines so so we're always looking for a good manufacturer and, and, a, and a good presence in, in aircraft uh, engines and one thing as a company uh, we've always uh, strived to do uh, and, and my dad started doing this uh, already back in in the in the 70s was designing airplanes not around a specific engine but designing an airplane to allow for for a, a, a large number of different uh, engine choices uh, for, for installation and uh, so so when we design an airplane develop an airplane it's really you know firewall back uh, obviously there there are certain uh, uh, engine weights and uh, power and, and horsepower considerations that go into it but we we try to leave it open as much as possible for a number of reasons uh, number one uh, to accommodate uh, uh, different budgets uh, a lot of different uh, engine choices and different engine costs as well as to uh, to be open for new technologies such as UL power and and new engines that come along uh, we can't all be uh, still using uh, the old style continentals and light Comings because uh, otherwise uh, we'll, we'll never see uh, progress uh, uh, coming up, coming forward uh, into the industry. So as a manufacturer, we've always embraced uh, new engines, and probably going back uh, five or six years, uh, we first were introduced to the UL Power, uh, first through Europe, and then uh, originally uh, through uh, through Gus Warren out of Florida, who, who originally represented the engine, and we were very intrigued uh, uh, about the engine for the same reasons that uh, that Robert presented about the engines, uh, the fact that it's a, a very conventional configuration, direct drive, air cooled. But uh, also is a very modern engine with uh, with the electronic ignition, the fuel injection, and so forth. So I think uh, it really is uh, is is a is a good uh, good representation of uh, of a modern light aircraft engine. And the nice thing with the with the horsepower range that it offers, uh, 97, I believe, to or, or 107 to uh, uh, 130 horsepower, it really uh, uh, is well suited for the light sport aircraft uh, category of the. Uh, of engines out there, or for aircraft, and uh, and then price-wise, uh, I think it's it's as as Robert demonstrated, uh, it's it's pretty much competitive with uh, most other light aircraft engines out there. So it's an engine that we think is a good choice for uh, for our line of aircraft, and uh, and we're happy to get involved with it to uh, to, uh, to to make it available to our customers. Now uh, the Zodiac is a is is our low-wing uh, cross-country. 
uh, all-metal uh, two-seater aircraft. Uh, the CH-650 is our latest model of the Zodiac line. Um, the Zodiac aircraft was first introduced uh, back in the mid-80s uh, as designed as a primary category airplane. And then uh, over the years, it's, it's evolved and, and uh, came out as, a, as a, one of the first light sport aircraft models available. And the CH650 model came out about uh, about two years ago as a as a latest model for that. And uh, putting the uh, the uh, UL350 uh, IS engine has really uh, given this airplane a, a whole new personality. Um, I had the uh, the honor of, uh, just uh, last month to fly the airplane to to the Sebring LSA Expo. Uh, it's about I don't know about a thousand miles each way, and uh, really had a chance to really spend some good time with that engine and and with that airplane, and uh, was very very pleased with the results overall. Here we can see just a bit of an outline of the the Zodiac features. Uh, it's a kit airplane, all metal construction, uh, low wing side by side uh, configuration. And uh, there, there are many of them out there now. Uh, we had uh, the original CH601, the 601 HDS models, then the XL model, and uh, we all heard about the uh, the upgrade uh, package that we did uh, about three years ago, three two years ago for that aircraft. Uh, there, were, there were there were a few structural issues uh, that uh, some customers experienced. So there was no real consensus on. On the exact cause and and and, and so forth, but uh, anyway, a couple of years ago, we came out with the with the full upgrade uh, package to to really uh, beef up the airplane and provide new reassurance to the owners and operators of the aircraft. And since that's come out, uh, everybody has been been really quite pleased with the airplane. And the 650 model has has really built on that. Uh, we continue to uh, improve the design, make new features available. We have a, a nice new canopy system. Um, on the aircraft, a new swept back uh, uh, rudder tail section, and uh, a number of new uh, of new upgrades and features uh, for it. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, by putting the UL power engine, we're we're developing more power, better performance, and uh, just a, a much nicer feel for the airplane as well. And uh, here's a nice view of the uh, UL 350IS engine that we have installed in it. And uh, here's a, a an additional view of the, of the installation prior to the to the cowl being put on, and uh, part of our interest in developing a firewall forward uh, installation uh, for one of our airplanes is to make it easier for our customers to install the engine. Of course, and so we go through all the steps and procedures in doing a proper installation. We engineer the weight and balance of it, and we do uh, everything that we can so that uh, so that we we really uh, standardize the installation. Here's a nice view of our uh, CH650 demonstrator airplane with the 350 IS installed, and it's no coincidence that behind we have the uh, CH750 aircraft uh, uh, behind it. Now they're, they're currently in that airplane. We have the uh, the Jabiru 3300 engine installed, but it's also our plan to uh, to be able to install the the uh, the uh, UL uh, line of engines as well in that airplane. The very very adaptable and the ideal configuration for that also. Uh, this is the panel we have. This is actually a, a, a picture of the actual panel in the uh, in in our uh, CH650, and it uses a, the Dynon Skyview uh, glass panel displays. We have the 10-inch on the left side and the 7-inch on the right side. They actually share the same information on on both panels. It's just that uh, you can uh, select what is displayed on on the screen. And with that panel combined with that modern engine, it makes just for a very very nice uh, state-of-the-art airplane. Uh, here we are flying the the UL uh, powered CH650. In the left side, uh, those of you that are Zenith customers, uh, you may recognize Joyce, our office manager, and uh, or on the left side of the screen in the right seat. And on the left uh, in the left seat, piloting the airplane is Roger Dubert, our demo pilot. And uh, this is actually uh, on the way coming back from Florida. This is the Sewanee River uh, below and uh, flying overhead. Um, I, I was able to get some, some really nice videos and, uh, and take some really awesome uh, photographs of flying uh, 
flying uh, to, uh, to Sebring and coming back from Sebring. And this is me uh, flying in the CH650. And here, this is just a quick overview of the trip uh, down to Sebring. Started off in Mexico, and you can see the little red dots along the way uh, flying down. Now, normally we do some, we uh, we fly some pretty good legs, uh, uh, a little bit longer than what we see here. But we had quite a bit of weather, and uh, the first stop, which was Farmington, Missouri, was an overnight stop due to weather. The second stop in Dyersburg, Tennessee, was also an overnight trip due to weather. And then I believe we ended up again spending the night in uh, Perry, uh, Florida, uh, before uh, making it into Sebring. It took us uh, three days to get there. And if you see coming back, this is our, our the view of uh, of our flight back was uh, was even longer than that. It, uh, it again we were had an overnight in Perry, Florida, and uh, and I believe a couple of nights in Sykes, in Missouri, before making it back to Mexico. Uh, despite the, the weather, we had a great trip. It was a good opportunity for us to fly the airplanes and to spend some good time uh, with the UL Power engine. All right. Sebastian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt with one quick question sure. since you're talking about the trip to Florida. What was the fuel burn on that trip? Well, uh, th that's a good question, and I don't have a I don't have the exact answer on that, but that's that's a that's a good question. Uh, I I have. Depending on how I was flying, uh, like I was just mentioning, I, I, I was flying with Roger, who was in a CH 750. You know, the, our 750 is a relatively slow airplane; it's about a 100 mile an hour cruise airplane, which is uh, compared to the Zodiac, that's that's pretty slow. So a lot of the time, I was throttled right back. And uh, I think one of the last quotes that uh, that uh, Robert showed was, uh, I think that was one of my quotes actually. It was uh, flying at 2,200 RPMs, 100 miles an hour four gallons per hour because when I was flying with Roger that's that's exactly what I was doing uh, uh, four gallons an hour which is very very economical for for a little airplane and uh, 100 miles an hour sure that's not very fast but uh, throttled right back that's probably about 55 maybe 60 percent power setting um, on that engine um, other times uh, cruise uh, cruising uh, configuration about 2700 rpm it seems to be right at around six gallons per hour in fuel burn, which is uh, again that's that's very acceptable and, and and really quite economical for a modern light aircraft engine. And uh, well, here we go. There's there's the numbers right here. Uh, Twenty seven hundred RPM uh, yields about one hundred twenty mile an hour cruise speed and uh, six gallons per hour. And these are all pretty much uh, sea level performance uh, figures. If you're going up, of course, going up a little bit higher, it yields a little bit better. Uh, performance numbers and as you can see the the sea level rate of climb is is really excellent a thousand feet per minute now that's at full gross weight and that's uh, I think that's even uh, a, a fairly conservative figure uh, quite often uh, well maybe right now it's a little bit cooler out so we sometimes show a little bit uh, better performance but uh, we'll show 12 1300 feet per minute uh, rate of climb uh, really quite impressive and another thing that's also impressive with that airplane is the short takeoff uh, performance. Uh, we actually have the, our first flight uh, video. It's it's on YouTube or, or linked to YouTube through our website. Uh, it, it it's it's a pretty uh, impressive takeoff performance because it's uh, it's uh, the first flight. So Roger uh, Dubert, the pilot on that, uh, really wasn't trying to trying to pull off uh, pull the airplane off the ground in a short time. He was more concentrating on. I'm making sure you have a, a uneventful first flight experience, and uh, the airplane still just jumped off the ground at probably about 200 feet. Uh, very impressive numbers. Here's a view uh, behind the uh, UL Power engine. We kind of have a, a nice, unique-looking uh, cowl on that airplane uh, to, to fit the, the kind of a wider stance than we're used to seeing on, on a light aircraft engine compared to the Rotax or compared to the Jabru engine. But uh, it makes it a very attractive look over the cowl for, from that standpoint. And then, of course, uh, those, those two uh, Dynon panels are really gorgeous uh, screens to look at. 
here's a bit on the specifications on the airplane as uh, as equipped. Uh, 780 pounds is is the weight of our demo airplane, and that's with paint, with upholstery, pretty much everything uh, uh, on that airplane uh, as equipped. And it's and it's not a sparsely equipped airplane by any means. The nice thing is that gives us a 540 pound uh, useful load, which for that class of airplane is is really quite quite good. Um, even after carrying 144 pounds of fuel, which is about uh, about four hours of endurance, we still have a, an honest 400 pounds of payload, which which again for for an LSA class airplane is really quite good. And uh, one of the nice things about the Zodiac, although we're finding a lot of the low wing airplanes are are fairly similar, also it's just the fact that it's a it's a roomy little uh, two seat airplane, 44 inches across at the shoulders. And the uh, and the angle of the seating is very comfortable uh, on the trip down to Florida and back. I was probably in the air. Well, it wasn't very long, but about three hours at a stretch, or at the longest stretch. Uh, but after three hours, I'm still very comfortable in that airplane. It's a it's a, a reclined seating angle. It's kind of like sitting in a lazy boy. So after two or three hours, it's still very comfortable to get out. And uh, here's a summary of our costs in the airplane, which. Uh, which uh, basically just the standard uh, uh, kit pricing, which is the airframe kit and the finishing kit, which is together that's under twenty thousand dollars. Now the avionics uh, uh, package on that airplane is about thirteen thousand, maybe a little bit more with the dual dynons, but uh, but uh, for for the for the equipment and the features on there, it's a very I think a very competitive price. And uh, and then with the UL uh, 350 IS engine and the Firewall 4 package, that brings a total to under uh, sixty thousand dollars, which uh, you know cost is a it's a very relative thing. But uh, the way I like to look at it is it's still half the price of most factory built uh, LSA airplanes out there. And the nice thing with that uh, that airplane is a very nicely equipped uh, state of the art engine, state of the art avionics, and uh, a really good little flyer. Now, of course, for those that that don't want to spend that kind of money, that's it's it's definitely uh, available also for for quite a bit less. One of the nice things about building your own airplane is that the builder, you, the builder, can make your own decisions. You are the manufacturer of the airplane, so you can choose what to put on the panel. You can choose to uh, what engine to install, as well as you can even choose uh, what what you're going to build. It's uh, whether you're going to build from the kit, from uh, plans or manuals, or component kits and so forth. Uh, we even have some customers that claim uh, uh, that they're in the air for in the low 20s uh, in terms of cost, but that's you know scratch building a lot themselves, uh, scrounging around for for a used or rebuilt engine, and probably not putting very much on the panel. But it can be done, as well as we get some that spend uh, more than the sixty thousand uh, dollars as well, uh, depending putting more equipment on the panel, uh, spending more on the on, uh, on on upholstery and paint and so forth. And uh, but that's still at the end of the day one of the beauties of uh, building your own airplane is, is you the builder can can decide uh, how much you want to spend and, and decide what you want how, how you equip the airplane and what you put on the airplane. And here's uh, this is just a, an older slide showing just some of the some of the features of the Zodiac CH 650 design from the canopy system uh, uh, to the to the construction features and, and so forth on the airplane. And uh, this is, I know this is not my program here tonight to talk about so much about the airplane as much as our experiences uh, working with uh, the UL power engine. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on this element of it. Although if some of you uh, want to ask questions uh, later on, I'm sure more than happy to uh, answer questions uh, like that. Uh, going back to the engine, uh, um, as, as uh, you can see on the slide, uh, one of the design considerations for this airplane, again, is to is to offer builders choice of uh, engines, and uh, you know while uh, we we want customers to be able to to choose the engine that they want, at the same time we want to steer them also in the right direction in the sense that uh, uh, a good engine will will help if you have a good airplane, and so it's always in our interest to kind of steer customers in a direction that that will uh, that uh, that uh, that will give them the best engine and the best uh, ownership experience in an airplane. Uh, here, this is a top view in the Zodiac airplane. Again, just to demonstrate the the comfortable side-by-side -side seating configuration and so forth. 
Now, if you look at the at the controls on the engine controls uh, coming out of the instrument panel, you can tell that's not a UL power engine because there's a, a mixture control on there and there's a carb heat control uh, on there as well. That's going back to the UL power uh, and flying the UL power engine. That's one of the beauties of it is you just have a single throttle control. You have a key switch to turn it on and to turn it off, and a throttle one throttle control, and that's everything you have. Nice thing I like about it is that I can't mess up anything really with it. I can't be too lean. I can't be too rich. Uh, I can't uh, over prime it or or uh, put too much uh, or forget the car beat on or car beat off. So this way, it uh, forces me to be a, a good operator on the air on the engine, and uh, this way I can enjoy my flying quite a bit more because uh, I don't have to to worry about uh, going through my checklist on uh, mixture control or car beat. So that's that's really one of the nice things about uh, the FADEC control on on that engine. Here we just kind of have a quick overview of the of the kit and all the different uh, components that make up the kit. And another nice view of that panel. I really enjoy that new panel and that airplane. Uh, those those Dynon sky views uh, really uh, provide a lot of information. And of course, uh, we get all the the good engine information as well on that screen. On the right side of the screen, you can see uh, it's, they're a little bit small to see well, but you can see all the engine controls right there all the CHTs, all the EGTs, and uh, of course RPM and the oil temperature and pressure and, and all that fun stuff. And uh, uh, like, uh, like Robert Helms was mentioning, it, uh, you also have access to all that data so that uh, you can download it to your laptop and, and review all that data later on, seeing uh, what your temperatures were doing and so forth, so that uh, making sure that you can really uh, operate that engine in the best, uh, best conditions and best environment. And here, this is just a nice picture of flying the 650 airplane. Now, this and this photo here is actually showing that's the the cal for the Continental O200, which is a little bit different than the than our new uh, cal for the 350. And I think overwhelmingly, people uh, have uh, have come back and given me the opinion that the, the they find that the the new cal for the UL power engine is gorgeous, really nice, uh, really nice inlets uh, for the air cooling. And this is our kid here laid out at the factory. This was we did that at the for the for the FA actually that came out to inspect the kit uh, to meet it for uh, determining the eligibility for the 51% rule. So since the FA wanted to go through the, all the individual parts and components that made the the whole kit up, we decided why not uh, lay everything out on the floor at one time. If uh, it certainly makes a nice uh, photo opportunity as well. And then the the box with fragile written on it. That's the the one crate that all the parts are packed in, uh, so that uh, it can be delivered to a customer that way. And these were the five uh, FA uh, staff members that came out to inspect the kit and uh, determine that it meets a 51% rule. And uh, here I'm just going to take a, a quick little uh, moment to, to talk quickly about our other designs. And part of that is that uh, our other designs are also well suited for the UL Power Engine. Um, here we can see for the uh, for the uh, the CH750, which is our popular high wing uh, stole airplane. Again, the same summary of costs, uh, that pretty much exactly the same numbers as. Uh, we had with the uh, with the uh, CH650 for under sixty thousand dollars. Have a very very nicely equipped airplane with the with a state of the art engine, state of the art panel, and a very quick build kit, all for under sixty thousand. And again, for those of you that uh, that may find that a little bit outside of your budget, keep in mind that you can do it for less. There are the smaller UL power engines as well as well as uh, more basic uh, uh, instrumentation uh, for the to put on the panel. And uh, certainly invite all of you to come, go out to our to our website zenithair.com. We have lots of information there about all the different models. We also have a uh, a builder website, uh, the Zenith Aero uh, uh, site, uh, which is a, 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 a online community for and about actual builders and owners of these airplanes. So you guys can we invite you to share information about building and flying your airplane. It's a lot of fun uh, to follow each other, to encourage yourselves along as you build and, and really have a good sense of community. And uh, I think that pretty much wraps up uh, everything I wanted to say about it. Uh, 
Um, again, I want to to to, uh, to emphasize the fact that uh, that we're really happy and proud to be part of the of the UL Power community. Uh, we think it's a great engine choice. Uh, we think it it really provides uh, a good alternative engine for for uh, builders of of many of these uh, light sport aircraft uh, uh, kits out there. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to develop the firewall forward uh, kits, not only for our CH650 and, and, and uh, 750, but also for our earlier models, uh, the 701 uh, airplane as well. And uh, as Robert was mentioning, there are new models, uh, engine models in the works for larger engines that also could uh, work in our four seat uh, models as well. So I think, uh, again, I thank you for, uh, for, uh, listening in and I would certainly uh, look forward to answering any questions you may have. All right, sounds good guys. Uh, we do have a pretty good list of questions here. Um, I, I do want to apologize everybody about the audio problems we had up front there. Uh, I'm not sure if it was a mic issue or what, but Sebastian's mic was a little bit better so I wonder if, um, if there's engine specific questions if maybe we could put Robert on the on the mic that Sebastian was using. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and get to some questions here. Several people have asked about the uh, TBO for the UL engines. Is there a projection for them? Okay, I've got my microphone on. Sebastian and I are at different locations, so I can't use his mic. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you guys were together tonight. Sorry about that. No. Uh, I do notice when I speak, my indicator is going up into the red, so I don't know what the problem is. That's right. We'll make do. The TBO on almost all of our engines is 1,500 hours, and there's a really good program in the archive, the EA webinar program dealing with TBOs, and I really recommend you listen to that. The TBO is the recommendation, and there's also with every engine a, a lifetime TBO recommendation, and ours is eight years, and eight years is common, uh, 10 years uh, on some engines as well. Okay, um, let's go. Question for uh, for Sebastian. Well, either one of you two, I guess. Um, several people have asked about the dual battery setup on the firewall of 650. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we originally put the dual batteries uh, because, in hindsight, we miscalculated uh, the, the the power usage for the aircraft. Uh, based on our earlier calculations, we ended up with only about a 20 minute uh, uh, time uh, that it would that if the alternator stopped working that we would have that it would have 20 minutes to operate drawing on the battery in hindsight it's now it's probably about an hour per battery and we have two batteries set up so you could you could run not only the engine but also the the, the fuel pumps as well as the the dual glass panels for about two hours based on the on the dual battery setup with no alternator output at all so it's really a lot more than you need um, so on our on our demo airplane, we still have the dual uh, battery set up uh, on on the firewall four packages that we are starting to supply now. We're only recommending the single battery, and of course, if if someone wanted to put a second battery and it's it's mounted in series with the with the first battery, that they they can do it, but it's really not necessary. The alternator has permanent magnets. You can start the engine and turn off the master, and the engine will continue to run off the alternator. If you do lose the alternator, uh, like Sebastian was saying, on a fully charged 12 volt battery, you can operate the engine for, we estimate, 45 minutes to be safe. And then if you install the second battery, then that doubles that. Okay. Um, how about uh, one from, uh, let's see here, let's pick a good one. How many UL engines across all models are installed and flying? That's from Jim. We don't know. We don't know the installed and flying number. We've shipped between three and four hundred engines worldwide. In the United States, we have about forty engines uh, delivered, and probably about ten or fifteen of those are installed and flying, and the balance are in, in kits that are in progress. Okay. Uh, any plans to certify the engine? No. It would be a very, very expensive uh, proposition to get certification um, for, you know, certified aircraft. 
Uh, we do plan to get uh, SLSA certification. Well, the engine itself doesn't get certification, but be self-certified that the engine meets the standard, the ASTM standard, and then the aircraft manufacturer can put it on their airplane and put on their certificate. So it will be SLSA, but it will not be a certified engine. And as a customer for the uh, for that engine, I, I really hope and, and have uh, recommended to UL Power that they don't certify it because, again, we all know what it does to the price. Uh, the engine itself will, will probably not change, would probably not change, but we know the price would go up a bunch because of the cost uh, associated with certification. Um, you know, you look at the Rotax uh, 912 uh, ULS engine, 99% uh, of the engines that they deliver are non-certified. They do have a 912S certified engine, but it just adds $10,000 to the price. It doesn't change the engine in any in any meaningful way, but it adds uh, a bunch to the price. Okay. Um, sounds good. We've got a really good attendance uh, going with this um, end of the question and answer session here. We've still got nearly 300 people listening, so Great. I appreciate everybody sticking around. Uh, Vic wants to know, on cars we have a check engine um, you have check engine lights. How does the UL system tell us that part of the ignition or fuel injection system has failed? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. <clears throat> I'll defer to Sebastian. I don't know if they installed it, but there is an output, um, a wire out from the ECU. You can have a red, red light on the panel that says there is an error. And then we have the diagnostic program. You can connect the computer to the RS-232 port and you can do diagnostics. Um, but the, the diagnostics, the laptop, you will not connect in flight. Now, uh, at Oshkosh, I spoke with Dynon, and just as recently as today, I got an email from Dynon, and they are looking at all of the data that's available coming out of the ECU, and they're going to take whatever data they can and actually uh, run that to the, uh, the Dynon instrumentation. And so hopefully in the future, we'll have some really good you know, real-time analysis of the operation of the engine. Okay, how about uh, propeller selection? There's several people who have asked about using a metal propeller because it looks like a composite props have been used uh, in most of these pictures. Yeah, I'm not sure if I... Okay, can I take that, Robert? Sure. Okay, yeah, I I'm not sure if, uh, if I covered that earlier, but uh, we have a 65-inch uh, composite ground-adjustable whirlwind propeller on ours, and uh, it's, it's one of the only props that we've tried out so far being a being a new engine there aren't a lot of different prop uh, props available yet for the engine I know Sensenek is working uh, for uh, on a prop for us specifically uh, optimized for that engine so we look to trying out a number of, uh, of different propellers uh, uh, for it it is such a lightweight engine that I think it would be quite suitable for for heavier props such as an all-metal uh, prop especially for for folks that wanted to do more uh, more uh, operation in, in uh, you know IFR operations in weather and rain and so forth but uh, the 65 inch whirlwind propeller uh, we have it set at about 21 degrees and it really provides uh, amazing takeoff and, and climb performance as well as very acceptable uh, cruise performance. Uh, Sensenich has a very nice prop for the smaller engine for the 260 and uh, the, the prop flange we offer both the Vertex style prop flange and the SAE one style prop flange so you can basically put any type of propeller you want on the engine. Okay, how about, uh, let's go to um, Victor wants to know if there are any cooling problems. Um, he's asking specific, specifically about the 750, but uh, because I know the Jabiru's had some cooling issues um, with that airplane, but as installed in the 650, is there any cooling issues? We have had absolutely no problems at all. Uh, we started uh, operating our UL 350IS and our CH650 uh, pr just prior to Oshkosh, and uh, if uh, those of you can remember, we've had a very hot we had a very hot summer this past year. Uh, we were in the high 90s, even in the low 100s. Uh, uh, shoot uh, for probably for three weeks uh, with. Uh, uh, without any breaks and so it was a good good opportunity for us to try out that engine and to evaluate it and we didn't have any uh, cooling issues at all uh, throughout that whole uh, initial flight test program. I know we were a little bit worried about flying it to Air Venture uh, because uh, we didn't have a ch chance to, to fully uh, uh, complete our, our cooling uh, tests but uh, it 
really was not an issue. Uh, I know they uh, UL Power was was uh, was selling us on those points, but it's one of those things. It's uh, not until we try it out that that we experience that. But we've we've been very impressed with the cooling on that engine. I think the modern alloys and and the modern design has has really proven itself out well that way. The, the cylinder heads are designed so that the operating temperature is cool enough that if the pilot cuts the throttle from full power or cruise power to idle cutoff, that it won't shock cool the heads. And then we also have oil under pressure, a line that comes into the cylinder heads with a spray bar spraying on the rockers, and that helps cool the heads a little bit as well. Okay, um, I've got two questions in one here, actually. They're two separate questions, but they go together. So, um, is the uh, exhaust included in any of the firewall forward system, or is it uh, manufactured by others? And also, uh, to go along with that, how does the cabin heat work? The exhaust, the muffler, we have two different size mufflers, and we also offer a straight exhaust system. So you can do a straight exhaust, or you can do a small muffler or a large muffler. And on our web page, it's got uh, we have the list of parts, and you can see all the different uh, in the part standard and option. And then, uh, depending upon the size of the muffler you want, Zenith went with the smaller muffler on their firewall forward kit. And then we have an optional uh, little heat shroud for cabin heat. And uh, Zenith has that installed as well and is operating that on their aircraft. And if if I can just add that, uh, well, one of the things uh, that 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 is a little bit unique with the UL Power engine is that when you're buying the engine, you're actually uh, having the muffler and the exhaust system is included with that engine purchase, which is again when you're looking at the prices that sometimes it's a little mis you know we're comparing apples to oranges sometimes because they do include uh, a stainless steel exhaust uh, with the cost of the engine, which I know with the, most other engines that's not the case, and. Uh, to, to address specifically the, the cabin heat uh, question, uh, it, it works really well. We've been flying ours uh, well this past uh, this past month, uh, and it hasn't been very cold, but it's been it's been cool. I know the last couple of days were very cold, and this morning uh, we were really appreciating the cabin heat. And after uh, after a few minutes, it gets real toasty, at least down at the toes. Good deal. Um, a question that a lot of people probably want to know. Um, people with faster airplanes uh, outside of the LSA category, will there be any um, engines issued or uh, developed with 180 horsepower? That's from Jean-Claude. Yeah, uh, in terms of speed, the 130 horsepower, a lot of people are looking at it for existing aircraft designs. Um, one guy wants to put 130 horsepower in his 1X, and I talked to Jeremy and he said that airplane with 130 horsepower probably to 195 miles an hour at cruise. Um, so that'd be quite a quite an airplane. Yeah. We're developing a we're developing a six cylinder engine, and that's what I was saying. They've tested it on the bench, and it will be available. It'll be the same basic engine, the same design, the same components. It'll be available in the low compression and the high compression, and in the, the narrow deck and the wide deck. And so it begin at 145 horsepower and go on up to probably 200 horsepower. And we're working on the pricing right now, and we're hoping the engine will be available by Oshkosh. Excellent. That, that makes me happy, because I'll be uh, shopping for a Tailwind engine. <laughs> yeah, we'll have uh, 145 horsepower, and then 100, probably about 165 horsepower will weigh about 200 pounds, and then 180, 185 horsepower, and 200 horsepower should weigh about 220 pounds. And that's for a complete installed running engine. Excellent. Okay, uh, you may have already addressed this. I, I, if I missed it, I apologize. Uh, Peter has asked, um, how is redundancy set up since there's no left to right magnetos that's going into the FADEX system? Uh, there's only one single point of failure, and that is the FADEX itself. We do have a dual ECU option, so that makes the FADEX redundant, and it's about $2,000. And so it's really up to the to the owner builder to decide if they you know if they really feel that there's a chance that the ECU will fail, then they can get that option and then that, that eliminates. But there's dual ignition, there's two coils. Um, in terms of the fuel injectors, if one fails, you've still got three. The throttle position sensor, if it fails, it fails rich. Uh, there's two crankshaft position sensors. 
there's either a fail-safe mode or redundancy on all of the components except the ECU, and we have that as an option. And uh, we, we studied that, uh, you know, going into it. We were concerned, like everybody else, at, at least initially, uh, uh, because of that. But uh, we studied it, we, 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 we researched it, and uh, discussed it with uh, UL Power, and, and they really convinced us that that ECU is, sure, it's a single point of failure, but it's, there, there's so much that's built into it that it's, it's a very unlikely event, uh, just, like, uh, just like a normally aspirated engine only has one carburetor. It's, uh, it's just something that, uh, that, that we can certainly live with and think that they've addressed all the potential problems very well so that uh, we decided not to go with the second ECU in our aircraft because we, we just don't think that uh, there's a need for it. Okay, uh, this question is from Sonny. Wants to know if there's any pictures and or video of the UL Power Manufacturing Facility showing the assembly of the engines. I don't, I don't know if there is, but um, I'll see if I can get something put together and, and get it on the website or on Facebook. That's a great idea. Yeah, that, sound, that would be interesting to see, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. Has there, any been, uh, any been, has there been any research and development on forced induction from Arthur? Yeah, we have a uh, ram air cooling option. Uh, you can take the air filter off and, uh, you know, plumbing you know, Put the uh, a hose to a you know do like a, a certified airplane. You can have the air filter in the nose with the air intake or a vacuum scoop or something like that. And then on the 260i, before we developed the 350 series of engines, we had a turbocharger installation on the 260i, and it was very successful. It was put together for a quotation for a drone, military drone operation, that was never we never got the contract. Um, but we just thought it was too complex to, to actually market it commercially, so that's when we developed the 350. And we got, you know, except for the high altitude takeoff performance, we had the power that we, you know, that we wanted with the 350 series. Okay, uh, what kind of fuel are we using? 100 low lead, 94, auto gas. What's uh, what's been the fuel of choice? Well, for us as uh, as as a user on the engine, we've just been staying right now with 100 low lead, uh, primarily for the reason that we we fly a lot cross country, so we never know where we're going to get fuel. So we just try to stay with one fuel type that we can uh, rely on. Um, so we've just stayed with the 100 low lead fuel. It's a little bit more, but it's it's readily available for, in our case. I know a lot of our customers plan on on uh, using uh, auto gas and and. Uh, Using the own, bring in their own fuel out, whether to the airport or to their grass strip. So, uh, we certainly like the ability that it uh, is suitable for for either type. And uh, like I said, we've had really good luck with the hundred low lead. The low compression engine can use ninety one octane, and the high compression engine is ninety three octane. Or you can use hundred low lead on any of the engines, and you can mix and match as well. Okay. Uh, this question is from Richard. Uh, is there any projections on overhaul costs? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the number. Um, there have been so few overhauls, and there were more just to investigate uh, to see you know how the engines were wearing. And I do have the number, uh, but I don't remember it. I'll put it on my Facebook page tomorrow. And it's it's basically an estimate based upon the parts that we recommend to be changed at the overhaul and then the labor to do the overhaul. And so I'll post it on the Facebook page uh, maybe tomorrow. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Does the does the fuel injection system have any redundancy? The fuel pump, uh, Zenith offers through their firewall for a kit, and we offer as an option a second fuel pump. And so the initial fuel pump is typically wired through the ECU, and then you've got a second fuel pump for emergencies. You could also use it if you want on takeoff and landing. We don't recommend running the two pumps at the same time because they'll probably overheat. There won't be enough fuel flow to cool both pumps, but that's an option. And then on the engine itself, um, there's four injectors, and so there's redundancy in terms of the injectors as well. Okay. Uh, Sebastian, this question is from Thomas. Uh, how far along are you with the CH750 firewall forward for the uh, larger engine, for the 350IS? Well, we're 
we're pretty much done. Uh, one of the nice things between the 650 and the 750 uh, designs, they share the exact same firewall. So we've we've actually been done with it for for quite a while in the sense that once we have a 650 installation done, it's identical to the 750 uh, installation. And we've uh, we've sold quite a few of them already, and we're just starting to deliver the first ones uh, as we speak right now. So uh, uh, the 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 Cal was our was our our main hold up actually if you can see the slide that's up on the screen right now that was the original cow that we had for the for the 650 uh, since we've we've moved the oil cooler uh, the, the little radiator to the front of the to the front under the engine in the front and uh, that, so there's been a little bit of a, of a, of a time uh, time lag in getting all that done but uh, we have a very nice cow now available for the 750 uh, as well as the 650 so we are starting uh, deliveries um, I believe there's one, maybe two uh, 750s already flying now with the with the UL 350IS engine, and uh, with the 750, I, I think it doesn't need the power as with the 650. But uh, kind of like the survey results uh, showed, uh, the vast majority of the interest is in the larger engine. I think that's just uh, maybe human nature, but we always want a bit more power <laughs> than uh, than 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 what we probably need. Yep, and uh, you got you it. Know, in, in my personal opinion, if I were to, to build uh, a 650 for my own use, I would probably put the larger 260 uh, IS engine in it because I think the uh, the 100 and I think it's 118 horsepower, I believe, is uh, is more than adequate power for that airplane, and even have plenty of reserve power if and when I needed it. And then the fuel burn would be even uh, more economical. Okay, how about uh, availability of the engines? Is there any um, uh, backlog or delay in getting orders if uh, once they're placed? I try to keep uh, uh, enough inventory in the U.S. so that we can satisfy the orders pretty quickly. And uh, the estimate, we, I encourage people to budget about six to eight weeks for the lead time. And then uh, Zenith themselves uh, keep one or two engines in inventory as well for Zenith customers. And then the Zenith customers and other, uh, as soon as they have other OEM agreements, the plan will be, you know, whether you buy the engine from me directly or from the OEM, it'll be the, the same price and the, uh, you know, everything will be the same. So whether you buy it from the OEM or from me, it'll be the same. And for us as a, as a manufacturer, an airframe manufacturer, uh, you know, we, we like to supply engines as a convenience, but we, at the same time, uh, you know, our job is not to sell sell our customers an engine what we like again what we like to do is sell them or, or supply them with uh, what they what they can use to have a and install to, to provide them with with a good airplane a good flying airplane a good reliable engine so we want to encourage uh, customers to research as much as they can and uh, and, I, and I think like like a lot of them uh, are starting to now is is they're coming to the same conclusions that we are that the UL power is really a good choice for for this class of airplane Okay, uh, a couple of people have asked about uh, fuel return lines and whether or not a header tank would be a better um, option. That's a great question. Uh, a lot of fuel returns uh, from the engine to the airframe. The Just Highlander, there's a few Just Highlanders flying and uh, they have installed a header tank just because it was more convenient for them. Zenith has a uh, in the firewall forward kit of fuel selector valve that returns the fuel back to the tank that's in use and each tank uh, ships with the kit it has a fuel return line in the tank and so you could do it either way you could have the fuel return to the selected tank or to a header tank um, it's important if the tanks are not connected to each other that you return to the tank that's in use uh, because a lot of fuel returns to the tank Okay. Uh, how about service centers? Um, what uh, what's being done for parts availability, um, replacement for uh, parts in the field needed? Uh, what is there any sort of network set up? The the parts. If I don't have the parts available in my inventory, uh, or the service center doesn't have them, um, I can get them shipped very quickly from Belgium. But the plan is to have plenty of parts in inventory in the U.S. just so it's convenient. The, uh, we have one service center contracted, and that's Vertical Performance out of Cassville, Missouri, 
and that's what I was saying. He does a lot of work on the rotary exact helicopter engines. He's a, a service center for the Jabiru engines. Uh, he's a, the owner is a, a pilot, a CFI, an AMP, an AI, and he's got a lot of experience. He's got a really nice shop on the dyno, and he's just done a bunch of really neat things. And he's actually installing a, a 350IS in his uh, race, and he's building a a Sonorai, or Sonorai 2, and he's turning it into a single seat, and he's building a race airplane with that. Okay. Well, guys, we are uh, running up against our time here, so any final comments before we sign off? How about some contact information? Uh, the easiest thing, if anybody forgets, is simply, you know, to Google UL Power, and you'll either get to my webpage, which is ulpower.net, or uh, Belgium's webpage, which is ulpower.com. And my email address is r for Robert Helms, H E L M S, at ulpower.net. And okay. for me, uh, I certainly invite anyone to come and visit us at uh, zenithair.com, Z E N I T H A I R.com. Um, we have a lot of information about our different airplanes, about the different engine choices, and so forth. And uh, if you click on the contact uh, page, my, uh, my name and direct email and phone number is listed right on there. So I certainly uh, invite anyone, if any further questions or comments, uh, to, to feel free to uh, contact me at any time. Okay, sounds good. There, there's uh, still a long list of questions that we were unable to get to tonight uh, just because of time constraints. But if your question didn't get answered, um, please feel free to use uh, any of that contact information that was just mentioned. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. As I said, we had nearly uh, right around 300 people um, attend the webinar right up until the point um, we got about halfway through the question and answer session. So um, thanks, everybody, for sticking around. And um, we'll be signing off from Oshkosh and Missouri. And uh, I believe you're in Florida, aren't you, Robert? No, I'm in uh, Lake of the Ozarks in, in Missouri also. Okay, you're in Missouri also. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot for your participation tonight, guys. Really appreciate it. A lot of good information. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much.